Thanks, Alex. Um, it's, a, it's a delight to be here at Thea this afternoon. Um, I hope what I talk about today has some applicability to, to all of you, whether in your roles as educators, as students, uh, maybe as parents, or lifelong learners. Right, so I'm a cognitive psychologist by training, um, and my research focuses on applying principles uh, of human learning and memory derived from cognitive sciences to improve educational practice. And today I will talk about three phenomena that I think have important implications for learning and instruction. And the talk will revolve around three main questions that you see on the screen. Right, so the first part of this talk will, sort of be, will revolve around the first question, the role of tests. Do tests merely measure learning? Or perhaps can they do something more? Might they promote learning? And of course, I'll talk about studies that illustrate um, that phenomenon. Right? And that phenomenon is referred to as the testing effect. And then the second part of this course, I'm going to focus on the second question that looks at reviewing of information or reviewing of material that you have encountered before. If you're trying to learn something, should you wait a while before you review the information? Or should you try to review the information you know, soon after you encounter it the first time? And that is a phenomenon known as the spacing effect. And then when you're practicing something, should you sort of sequence the items during practice and group them all together, the items of the same type together? Or should you sort of mix them up? Right, mix them up with different items of different types. And that's the phenomenon known as interleaving. And I'll talk about studies that you know, illustrate these different phenomena and you know, some of the applic potential applications they might have in, in educational settings. And then I'll tie it all together with some general conclusions as well as spell out some future, future directions that uh, the research in my lab is moving towards. So if you were to ask any, you know, any average lay person or you know, any educator, student, you know, what's the purpose of tests and quizzes? Why do teachers bother to you know, administer quizzes and exams in the classroom? And almost invariably, the response you're going to get is, well, you know, teachers do that, educators do that, because they want to measure you know, the amount of learning that has taken place. They want, they want to assess how well their students have grasped you know, the content area or you know, the topics. And so almost invariably, the response you get is, tests are used to assess as an assessment tool. Right? But uh, decades of research in human memory has indicated that testing is really not a neutral event. It doesn't just measure the contents of learning. That actually taking a test can serve as a, a powerful learning opportunity. It enhances the retention of the tested information to a greater extent than just additional exposure, additional studying. And this phenomenon has been referred to as the testing effect. And also in the literature, sometimes people talk about it as the benefit of retrieval practice. Because imagine when you're taking a test, you're sort of retrieving, practicing retrieving information from memory. So that's the benefit of retrieval practice. And this phenomenon, you know, although you know, in terms of you know, the empirical scientific uh, data to support it, uh, has been around for, let's say, about 100 years, you know, this idea is, in a sense, not new. If you look at the writings of William James, for example, he was a you know, great philosoph American philosopher, widely regarded as the father of psychology here in America. He was sort of talking about this idea in his writings. He, talk, he says, you know, a curious peculiarity of our memory is that things are impressed better by active than by passive repetition. And I mean that in learning by heart, for example, when we almost know the piece, it pays better to wait and recollect by an effort from within than to look at the book again. If we recover the words in the former way, we shall probably know them the next time round. And if, if in the latter way, we shall very likely need the book once more. Right? So he's talking about the power of trying to recollect from within instead of just keep you know, repeatedly consulting the book. And then even before William James, several hundred years before, if you look at the writings of Sir Francis Bacon, right, he basically says the same, same thing. He says, if you read a piece of text through 20 times, you will not learn it by heart so easily as if you read it 10 times while attempting to recite it from time to time and consulting the text when your memory fails. So recite here, again, is the idea of, sort of reciting it from memory. Even 1,000 years before that, Aristotle basically said the same thing. He said, exercise in repeatedly recalling a thing strengthens the memory. So even you know, from philosophers of old have sort of you know, uh, 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 talked about this idea in their writings, right? the idea that retrieving information from memory might actually serve a very powerful function, helping us remember things. So a long history of research suggesting that testing, retrieving information from memory, can have a powerful effect on learning. But unfortunately, 
we don't actually see a lot of that sort of being implemented in sort of educational practice. Right? So if you look at the title of these two journal articles written by educational psychologists, you can sort of you know, get a sense of what they're saying. Right? So the first one says, by, by John Glover, his title of his paper in the Journal of Ed Psych says, the testing phenomenon, not gone, but nearly forgotten. Right? And in that same vein, Frank Dempster, another educational psychologist, wrote another article, similar article a few years later, where he talked about using tests to promote learning. He described it as a neglected classroom resource. Right? It's a kind of a sad state of affairs. Right? We've got this potentially powerful tool for learning, but we don't see it being implemented or applied in, in educational uh, settings. Thankfully, within the last several years or so, there has been a resurgence of interest in this testing effect and how it might actually be of use to educators. And so one question that you might think about is, well, how does it work? So testing it promotes learning, but what's the underlying mechanism? How, how do tests promote learning? And laid out on the screen here are three sort of plausible candidate mechanisms. The first one says, well, testing may produce its benefit because when you test someone, essentially you're giving that person sort of additional re-exposure to the target information. So maybe that's why testing produces its benefit. Maybe not a very interesting explanation, but nonetheless a plausible one. The second explanation says that when you test someone, they have to you know, engage certain mental operations and mental processes in order to do that test, right? the initial test. And so it's not surprising that if you test them later on on the final test to assess how well they have learned, they're going to benefit on that final test, right? Because they're basically engaging the same processes and operations that they had engaged in before. So you, get, you see this sort of positive transfer. You can think of it as sort of a practice effect. Right? So that's another plausible candidate mechanism. And the third possibility is that when you take a test, you have to retrieve information from memory in order to complete the test questions. Right? And that act of retrieval itself modifies the memory trace. And so the corollary of that is if you increase the retrieval demands and effort that's required on that initial test, you're likely to see greater, greater effects, greater benefits to retention. All right, so sort of keep these three plausible candidate mechanisms in mind as I describe to you the first study that's going to illustrate this testing effect. So this study, we conducted this study uh, with sort of two, for two broad purposes. One, to sort of get at that theoretical explanation, of how does testing produce its benefit? But also, the second purpose was to answer sort of practical questions, right? If we want to go around telling educators to implement, you know, use quizzing more regularly in the classroom, it might be useful to figure out, you know, are all test formats, you know, equally effective, or might certain test formats be, produce a greater benefit? So the question was, does test format matter? So in this first experiment here, we manipulated a few different things. One thing we manipulated was the initial test format. So we used two different test formats that are currently, you know, commonly used in the classroom, short answer versus multiple choice. And then we included a third condition where we basically just gave the students the answers to the test questions without having them actually take the test. Right? So it's really targeted re-exposure to the material. These are the exact answers you, you need to know. And then on the final test, we man man again manipulated the test format, short answer and multiple choice. And in this particular experiment, corrective feedback was provided on the initial test. So after doing each question, they would get the correct answer, right? So based on the three plausible candidate mechanisms described earlier, you can think of some competing predictions, what the results, what, what final test performance should look like. If testing produces its benefit merely because it provides targeted re-exposure to the information, then it really shouldn't matter whether you take a short answer test, a multiple choice test, or get to read the answers without taking the test. Right? In all three cases, you get repeated exposure to the target information. So that's one possible prediction. If testing produces its benefit because the operations recruited on the initial test are the same operations that are required on the final test, then test format would matter. If your final test is in the, is in the multiple choice format, then having had that initial multiple choice test should yield a greater benefit than having had the initial short answer test. And conversely, if your final test is in a short answer format, having that, had that initial short answer test or quiz should produce a greater benefit than having had that initial multiple choice quiz. So that's another possible prediction. And the third prediction here comes, comes out of the one that says testing produces its benefit because you know, retrieval modifies the memory trace. So the more effortful the retrieval, the greater the benefit to, to retention. And so here, test format matters as well, but it's the initial test format that matters. Right? So if, again, if you're thinking of multiple choice versus a short answer, a short answer test is a recall type test. You're supposed to retrieve the information from memory and then produce it. 
Whereas on a multiple choice test, you have options to choose from, right? So it is a short answer format that presumably involves more effortful retrieval. And so we would expect a greater benefit of having had that initial short answer quiz. So let me describe to you the procedure in this experiment. We gave our, this is a lab experiment. So we gave our subjects four short journal articles to read. And after reading each journal article, they underwent a particular intervening experience. So this was manip manipulated within subjects. So all subjects went through all four different intervening experiences, one after each article. Right? So for example, after reading the first article, they might get a multiple choice quiz on it. After reading the second article, they might get a short answer quiz. After reading the third article, they would get the answers to test questions without actually having to take the test. And after reading the fourth article, they, they would have gotten a filler questionnaire, sort of control baseline condition, no further exposure after reading the article. Importantly, again, feedback was provided on the initial quiz, right? So they got the correct answers after attempting each question. And then three days later, we asked them to come back to the lab, and then we tested them again on all four articles that they had read three days prior. And the final test, again, was in two different formats, multiple choice and short answer. So let's take a look at final test performance. So this is three days after studying and being quizzed on some of the material. Let's take a look at final multiple choice performance on the left. Performance was 69% if they had no further exposure after reading the article once. If they, had, if they were provided with the, the answers to test questions without actually having to take the test, not surprisingly, performance went up quite a bit. If they had taken a prior multiple choice quiz on the article, performance went up a little bit more. But it was having taken that initial short answer quiz that produced the greatest boost to final multiple choice performance. Now let's take a look at final short answer performance on the right. Again, if they just read the article and there was no further exposure to the article, performance was pretty low, 27%. If they were given the test answers without having to actually take the test, performance went up a little bit more, as we would expect. If they had taken a, an initial multiple choice quiz on that article, performance went up a little bit more. And again, what we see is having that initial short answer quiz is what produced the greatest boost to final test performance. So this is a demonstration of the testing effect, right? The idea is that having that initial test really enhanced later memory, and the enhancement was greater when the initial test format was short answer. So based on the competing predictions I laid out earlier on, our data, our results, seem to support the idea of retrieval effort, that the more effortful the retrieval on that initial quiz or initial test, the greater the benefit you, you get later on. Another practical question that we were interested in answering was, does feedback matter? Again, this is of practical importance to educators, right? Do, do we have to bother with giving our students feedback? And so we did the exact same experiment, except that we dispensed with feedback on the initial quiz now in this, ex in this late second experiment. So let's take a look at the final test performance three days later. Right, so the same setup. But if you remember the graph from before, the big difference now is that the red bars are no longer the tallest bars. Right, so the initial short answer condition isn't producing the greatest benefit now when feedback was not provided. And so what's the explanation for this? Why, why is it that you know, initial short answer quizzing isn't so effective now when feedback was dispensed with? And what I didn't mention is, was feedback performance, uh, was initial performance on that initial test. So that on the initial short answer quiz, performance was about 50%, just slightly over 50%. So that means for about half those questions, students could not produce the correct answer on the initial quiz. So if you don't give them feedback, certainly there's no way for them to correct their errors there then. Right, so now you don't see that much of a benefit of having taken that initial short answer quiz. So these results suggest that corrective feedback indeed is important, crucial, especially when initial test performance isn't high. So you might say, okay, that's a you know, lab experiment, perhaps kind of contrived. We're using the same questions on the initial test, using the same questions on the exact same questions on the final test as were on the initial quiz, and so on. So you can be perhaps not very ecologically valid, something that you wouldn't really find often in an actual classroom. So I'm going to describe to you a study that was actually done in a middle school classroom, and this was a, 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 a done in, in a science class. So this, the, uh, this group of researchers, McDaniel, McDermott, Rodiger, these are professors of mine at Washington University when I was a grad student, they have been doing this five-year study at a middle school in Illinois, and they, they you know, looked at quizzing and the effects of quizzing in the classroom across different content areas, different subjects, and this is just one paper that came out of that massive project, and this one looked at middle school science. And what's nice about this study is they looked they use different questions on the initial quizzing and on the final test. And I'll just give you an example here. So as part of their middle school science curriculum, students have to learn, the topic, learn you know, this topic of ecology. Right? So these are materials from that topic of ecology. And there were, importantly as well, two classes of questions. 
The first type of questions were called term response questions. These are questions that basically required students to remember the definitions of particular terms they were learning in this, in this, in this class. So, for example, a question would be, what is the struggle between organisms to survive in a habitat with limited resources? Right, so the answer would be competition. That's the definition of what competition means. And if that's the question that appeared on the quiz, then on the exam, there would be a different question, phrased differently, tapping that same concept but phrased differently. Right? So they do not see identical questions on the, on the initial quiz and on the final test or the final exam. They also had a second category of questions that they called application questions. So application questions here, as, as implied by the label application, involved applying their knowledge of some concept to, to you know, solve some sort of, you know, sort of problem or scenario. Right? So in this case, there's a scenario about foxes and raccoons. They eat a particular pheasant, some sort of animal, and then it's in decline. So you know, what's the relationship between the, the foxes and the raccoons? And of course, they are now in competition for a limited resource. Right? And, like, and, and similarly, if this is the question that appeared on the initial quiz, then on the final exam, it would not be the same question. The scenario would change now. It's about a group of pandas, and they eat the bamboo plant, and there's a drought, and so the bamboo is, there's limited bamboo. So what's the relationship of the pandas? So again, the idea is competition. And so all these four questions tap on the same sort of underlying concept of competition, but they all phrase differently. Right? Two, the two at the top called term response questions, because they basically just involve remembering the, 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 the definition of a term. And in the latter two questions at the bottom, they involve applying that knowledge towards some sort of scenario. Right? So the questions on the, on the initial quiz and on the final exams were never the same right, in terms of the wording. So it's not just memorizing, you know, I, I saw that the same question before, so I'm going to use the same answer later on. It's not that at all. So let's take a look at performance on the final exam. Right, the final exam, again, there are two types of questions, term response questions and application type questions. Let's first, like, first take a look at the performance on the term response questions on the left. This is on the final test. If they had been quizzed with term response questions on that topic, their performance was very good. Right? This is the baseline where there was no quizzing. Right? So you see a robust advantage. If you had taken prior term response questions, your, your final term response performance will be quite good. But interestingly, having taken an application-type question on the earlier quiz on that topic also benefited performance on the term response question on the final exam. Right? So you see this bar here is significantly higher than this bar. So that's for term response questions. Now let's take a look at application questions on the right. If students had taken a term response quiz, there was no real benefit to their ability to answer an application question on that topic relative to the baseline, the non-quiz condition. But if they had taken an application quiz question right here, you do see a robust advantage right here in the middle bar. Right? So this suggests that this benefit of quizzing extends beyond sort of just sort of pure memory type materials, right? just memorizing a particular word or a particular answer or a particular definition. That even in the case where you, the questions are never repeated, right? the scenario is always changed and so on, the wording is always changed, you do see a robust benefit of testing or prior quizzing, prior testing. And this even applies to sort of higher level questions you know, that involve application of knowledge towards some novel scenario. And so this is a nice classroom demonstration of how quizzing can actually benefit learning in the middle si school science classroom. And there's a second study that I thought is worth mentioning as well. This is a recent one that was published in PNAS in, in, just last year, actually. And this is a study that looked at whether having regular tests during online learning would actually be beneficial. And this, I, I think, is worth mentioning because, you know, this advent of MOOCs and all this, you know, who, you know lots of uh, buzz about online learning and edX and all these, these types of different platforms. And so let me describe to you what they did in this study, right? This study is out, out of Harvard. And they had three different conditions. In the tested condition, okay, let's, let me talk about the materials first. They basically took an intro stats type of uh, lecture, and they you know, videotaped it and so on. And then they, create, they divided into four short segments of I know, 10, 15 minute long segments. Right? And so the test condition, student, the subjects, these, these are, this is a lab experiment, the subjects would watch the first segment of the video lecture, they would do some math problems, and then they would be tested on that first segment. And they move on to watch the second segment, do some math, and then get tested on that second segment, watch the third segment, do some math, and then get tested on the third segment, and so on. Right? So that's a test condition. Regular tests interpolated right, throughout the, the, the different segments of, of, of learning. In the re-study condition, they would watch the same lecture, get some math, 
and be given sort of a summary sheet you know, to recap, that recaps the main points from the lecture. They'll watch the le second segment of the lecture, do some math, reread the summary sheet of the lecture, and so on. And, and then they also had a non-tested baseline where they watch the lecture, do some math, and do, do some more math. Watch the second segment of the lecture, do some math, do some more math. Right? So that's the baseline, no test, no restudy condition. And what's interesting in this experiment is at the end of the fourth segment, everyone received the test on that fourth segment. The second point that's interesting is during the lectures, they would present random probes to the subject to ask them, is your mind wandering now? Are you focused on the lecture or are you thinking of something else? Right, so this occurred randomly, and subjects would respond, are you am, I, am I thinking of the lecture now or am I focusing on something else? Right, so let's take a look at the results. First, let's take a look at mind wandering on the left, the left panel. Right, so T is the test condition, RS restudy, NT is no test, the baseline condition. And so these random probes will come, in, come out at random times. And what we see is in the test condition, there's a lower rate of mind wandering. Subjects report less mind wandering than in the other two conditions. Another interesting thing as well is subjects were actually given copies of the lecture slides as they watched, you know, as they watched the video lecture. So they told, let's pretend it's like a, you, this is a real course. You have the lecture slides in front of you. Feel free to jot down notes as you're watching the video lecture. And what we find is that in the test condition, students actually wrote down more notes on the slides, on the paper slides, copies of the slides that they had in front of them. So more note taking. And then remember, in the fourth segment, all conditions received the test on the fourth segment. And what we see is, in the test condition, there's better performance on learning of that fourth segment compared to the other two conditions. After they watched all four segments, they also had a final test that tested everything, right? all four segments. And again, they found that in the test condition, was, as you would expect, greater performance on that overall final test as well. Right? So these results are nice because it suggests right, that just by building in these short regular tests, interpolating these tests in the midst of a long sequence of online lectures might actually be a simple way to actually boost learning, right? Reduces mind wandering, increases note taking, and then boosts learning. So let me summarize what I've talked about in this first, uh, first part of the talk, right? Taking a test can be a very powerful learning event. It right? often yields better long-term retention of the information, of the material, than just additional studying. Right? I haven't, didn't have time to talk about you know, the dozens upon dozens of studies that have actually demonstrated this effect, but you know, these studies have used a wide range of different materials, right? both verbal materials, even nonverbal, abstract, visual, spatial learning, and so on. Testing actually benefits that type of learning as well. I didn't have time to, talk about, to illustrate a study about this, but repeated retrieval practice actually increases, maxima, you know, magnifies the benefit. Right? So you don't just have to quiz once. You can actually get people to take a quiz multiple times. And the more times they practice retrieval, the greater the benefit. And I described to you in detail a study that shows that the magnitude of this testing effect really is modulated by both test format and the provision of feedback. Right? So tests that require more effortful retrieval seem to confer a greater benefit to be more effective. And this implicates retrieval as the underlying causal mechanism as to why testing produces its benefit. And also, I showed you data that suggests that if you want to maximize the benefits of testing, it would be useful to provide corrective feedback when the initial test performance is low. And aside from these sort of direct benefits of testing, you can know, probably also think of sort of other ways in which testing would be beneficial, right? So for example, tests are useful for identifying gaps in knowledge. Right, when students try to take a test in the areas in which they bomb, they know, oh, you know, I, I really didn't understand that, that topic. Right? It improves metacognitive monitoring. Metacognitive monitoring refers to the learner's uh, online assessment of their learning as they go about learning. Right? So this is really an important uh, 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 skill. Right? If, if, if you are poor at metacognitive monitoring, if you don't know what areas you know well and what areas you don't know well, then it's hard for you to sort of regulate your studying. Right? How do you know when to stop studying? It's when you're confident and you think you know the material well, then you, I'm now I'm going to move on to a different topic because I know that stuff well, I'm going to move on. Right? So your metacognitive monitoring is really uh, crucial for, for effective learning in real life. Right? So testing, again, improves metacognitive monitoring because it allows you to figure out what areas do you know well, stuff that you can retrieve quite easily. Presumably that means you know that stuff well, and then stuff in which you cannot retrieve, it probably indicates you need to learn, you know, study that area a little bit more. And of course, testing also provides feedback to instructors. Right? If you, you know, as you grade your students' exams, you'll know, oh, you know, lots of students got tripped up on, on, on in this area, suggesting that maybe they were confused by something you said maybe in, in the lecture. 
right? And then maybe you can then re-emphasize the point in a future class. And then of course, as educators you know, or as students you probably know this as well, when you have lots of quizzes and tests, it compels students to study, right? Or encourages them to study, perhaps. Nice, nice way to put it. Um, so there's certainly indirect benefits of testing as well. And, but you know, as you might know, testing has had a bad rep in educational circles in, in, in recent times, right? But of course, if you think about it, that type of testing that has a bad rep is, is a different kind of testing that, you know, it's different from the testing I'm talking about. That kind of testing refers to sort of high stakes standardized testing, right? That determine what types of schools or tracks that students get assigned to and so on. The testing I'm talking about is really sort of regular quizzing, low stakes, sort of something that I, you know, I, I wish to see as, as sort of part of the normal fabric of a classroom. It's something that just it happens all the time. It, you know, students get used to it, and it's low stress, low stakes, right? And so it's really qualitative, qualitatively different kind of testing. Um, but nonetheless, there's lots of bad reps. So when you say testing, you know, it sounds like a dirty word sometimes in educational circles. But thankfully, on occasion, once in a rare while, we, you know, you'll, you'll actually see good press about testing. So this is actually, I think, in an upcoming issue of The Atlantic. It just came out online a week and a half ago on the website. And this journalist talked about how students should be tested more, not less. And of course, she was talking about all the benefits of testing that I, I just described in, you know, earlier on. I'm going to move on to part two of this talk. Right? And this part two, as I said, focuses on this question of when to review the material. Right? If you're trying to learn something, when should you revise or review the, the information? Right? Should you wait a while? Or should you just quickly try to review it right after you've seen it the first time? And so this relates to the phenomenon of spacing and the spacing effect, which, which, which um, describes this effect where reviews are more effective when they are distributed or spaced out in time rather than massed together. And this is even when total time is equated. So it's not the case that in one, one condition people study more, spend more time on the material. This is when even when time spent on the, on the material is equated, we find that if you space out your reviews, you basically get sort of more bang for your buck. More if, you know, each review opportunity is more effective. And this is really a, one of the most robust phenomena in the human learning and memory literature. It's been observed with a diverse range of materials, different kinds of learning. And again, something not, not very new. Right? Ebbinghaus is widely regarded as the uh, father of experimental research on human memory. So way back in Germany in, you know, in the 19th century, he would design all these experiments and test them on himself. He was the sole subject in all his experiments, very carefully designed experiments on learning. And what he observed when he was trying to learn these long lists of, of items, he observed that with any considerable number of repetitions, a suitable distribution of them over a space of time is decidedly more advantageous than the massing of them at a single time. Right? So this amazing observation he had you know, way back in the 19th century. And William James as well, when he gave talks to teachers, also sort of said the same point. Right? He talks about how cramming is so poor a mode of studying. He says, cramming seeks to stem things in by intense application immediately before the ordeal. The ordeal, here's the exam, right? But a thing thus learned can form but few associations. On the other hand, the same thing recurring on different days, in different contexts, read, recited on, referred to again and again, related to other things and reviewed, gets well wrought into the mental structure. This is the reason why you should enforce on your pupils habits of continuous application. This is William James in an address to teachers. So if you're going to study the spacing effect in an experiment, this is sort of the most basic structure of such an experiment. Right? You would have um, some initial encounter with the, with the information, initial study. There will be some gap in time. Then you review that same information, another gap in time. And then you would test the person to assess how well they have learned the information. Right? So that's the space condition, because there is a space, a gap between the initial study and the review. Below that is the mass condition. You have, have all the same events except that there's no gap between the initial study and the review of that information. Right? So I'm going to just display to you some, some results that illustrates the spacing effect. And in this study here, subjects were given 200, short passages, about 250 word passages to read. These were sort of fact-laden expository passages, passages on clipper ships, on rattlesnakes, and topics like that. Right? So students would learn, would read these passages, and then on some passages, they, they would read it the first time, then they would have a one-week gap, and they would be given the passage again to reread one week later. And then four weeks later, we brought them back and asked them to recall as much as they could from the passage that they had read four weeks earlier. In the mass condition, again, they would read the passage, and then right after reading it, we would give it to them again and say, hey, reread it again, right? 
And then four weeks later, we tested how much they could remember from that passage. Right? So these are just data to illustrate the spacing effect. The control condition here is where they only read the passage once. There was no rereading. Right, so this final recall performance, how much of the information could they recall on this final test four weeks after their last exposure to the passage? In the immediate reread condition, you see a little benefit of immediate rereading. But it's in the delayed rereading condition after one week, and then they got to reread again, that where they gained the most. Right? So in terms of time spent on the passage, these two conditions are equated. Both got to reread the passage once. Right? But it's in this condition where they gain the most from that rereading opportunity. So this illustrates the spacing effect. So it's like, this is the space study condition. This is mass because they got to reread it immediately, and we see this significant difference. And if you see from the, and again, this, this, this phenomenon that has great potential in educational uh, settings, but nonetheless, we don't actually see much evidence of it being applied in the classroom. And so again, Frank Dempster writes another paper in The American Psychologist. As you can see from the title, he talks about the spacing effect, a case study in the failure to apply the results of psychological research. These are a few quotes from that paper. He talks about the, the spacing effect would seem to have considerable potential for improving classroom learning, yet there is no evidence of widespread application. Even experienced educators, when judging the instructional effectiveness of text passages, tend to rate prose in which the repetition of a given unit of information is masked as better than those in which it is spaced. Right? So in short, the spacing effect is neither intuitively obvious nor well known among educators. Right? So again, kind of a sad state of affairs. Thankfully, with, again, with the advent of online learning technologies and platforms, there's potentially a, you know, an easy way to implement spacing. Right, so I'm going to describe to you a project done at Rice University. This is done with OpenStax Tutor. This is their online um, uh, learning uh, platform that the engineering school at Rice actually uh, created, designed. And so this platform basically requires instructors to first come up with a lesson plan, right? You know, what types of assignments and questions and learning goals they wanted to achieve in their course. And then they would sort of feed it into the OpenStax Tutor platform. And OpenStax would then create homework assignments, right? Would that, that, would, they would then administer homework assignments through OpenStax Tutor online platform. So students would log into it and do their homework through OpenStax Tutor. And they would respond to the homework assignments in two ways. They would first respond to each question in a free-form response, so like an open-ended question where they had to type in their response in an open-ended way. And then following that, they would be given a multiple-choice format, so they would then have to choose their response from a number of options. The, the reason they did that is so that OpenStax Tutor could actually score, score the responses immediately and actually provide them with feedback. Right? With the open-ended responses, that's not, that's not uh, feasible. And of course, then it, this, this system allowed students also to view the feedback, right? And so th they actually conducted an actual experiment on this in fall of 2012 with an upper level engineering class, Signals and Systems, at Rice University. This is, from what I've read, is a core class that, that you know, engineering majors have to take at Rice. And so this class was you know, identical to how the class was conducted before, right? So students would attend three hours of lecture each week. They would read the textbook, view videos online, view simulations outside the classroom, and so on and so forth. The, the only difference was that their weekly ho homework assignments were manipulated in this experiment. This was manipula manipulated within subjects. So half of the topics, the subjects would, would do the assignments the standard way, and the other half of the topics, they would do it in the OpenStax tutor. And so the standard way would just be you know, how the, the assignments were done previously, in the previous semesters. right? So they would cover, let's say, a topic in week one, and then in week two, they would do the homework assignment on that previous topic covered in week one. Right? So that was the standard way in which homework assignments were done in that course for many years. In the OpenStax Tutor format, however, the, the assignments were different. The same questions were used, but now the OpenStax Tutor basically implemented spaced retrieval practice. So that means that the practice problems for a given topic appear not just on, you know, in the assignment that just follows that, that topic, but also in the two subsequent assignments. So for example, the, you know, Problems pertaining to week one material were not just given on assignment one, but also given on assignments two and three. Right? So that's spacing it out, spacing out uh, the, the practice with those topics. And importantly, as well as I mentioned, the OpenStax Tutor uh, platform required students to view the feedback before they could gain credits. So all this is part of the course, right? They get credits for doing the homework assignments and so on. But, but in order to get credit, they would actually have to view the feedback before it would count as, as having completed the assignment. 
right? And of course, we contrast that with standard practice. Yes, in most cases, students are welcome to approach the TAs the following week after the TA has graded the standard assignment to get feedback and so on. But you know, if, I'm sure from your own experience, you'll know most students don't bother to do that, right? Whereas OpenStax Tutor required students to, to look at the feedback. And this is performance on the final and midterm exams. Right, so this is a closed book exam. This was the actual exam that counted for their grades and so on. What you see is topics that were practiced in the OpenStax Tutor assignments exhibited better performance than topics that were practiced in the standard way. Right, so about 7% advantage. Right, so these results are, are you know, I think, are, are in a sense, pretty impressive. Given that, you, again, this is a classroom environment, right? so you have no control over how often the students study, which topics they decide to focus on, things like that. Right? It's, it's unlike a lab study where you get to control all these extraneous variables. In the classroom, everything is left to vary. Right? But nonetheless, they still found this robust uh, advantage of implementing homework assignments in this OpenStax tutor. Right? And of course, you know, testing and spacing, in addition to OpenStax Tutor, other sort of online tutoring platforms have implemented th uh, testing and spacing as well. You know, famous one is supermemo.com, um, and there are lots of other competitors online as well. Um, this is an article published in the Wired magazine in 2008. It was a write-up of uh, Piotr Wozniak. Who's, he's a creator of Supermemo. Right? He claims that he has you know, uncovered this algorithm, this spacing algorithm that allows you to remember everything for life. Right? So as you can see from the title of the, uh, of the article, right? if you want to remember, remember everything you've ever learned, surrender to this algorithm. Right? Okay, so now, the time that I have left, I'm going to move on to this third, third sort of section of this talk, right? which deals with the question of when you're undoing some practice, right? should you sort of group together in a block, in a single block, group together all the items of the same kind or focusing on the same topic, or would it be better for you to sort of mix things up, intermix them with items from other topics? And I'm going to illustrate this effect of interleaving by, by talk, describing a study. And this is a study um, that was published in 2008 that was focused on individuals' learning of categories, learning of concepts. And it was done by Nate Cornell and Bob Bjork, and they were interested in testing the idea of whether spacing, spacing out of these examples that you encounter, would actually hurt your ability to learn categories or concepts. Right? So let's say you're trying to learn what, what a dog is. Let's say you're a little child, and you don't, you, you know, yes, you've heard a dog, you know, you've heard your mom refer to your pet dog as a dog, but then you see other types of dogs walking on the street, and you're trying to figure out, is that a dog as well? Right? Is that Chihuahua a dog? Is that huge, you know? German Shepherd a dog as well? Are they all the same category, within the same category? Right? So the idea here is perhaps if you, when you space out your encounters with examples or instances from the category, that might actually hurt your learning of the category. And so they wanted to test this idea. And so this is what they did. They were interested in students' lear learning of painters' styles, artists' painting styles. And so they trained the students, the subjects in their experiment, with paintings from, done by obscure artists. Right? And they presented the paintings in two different, two different, style, two different uh, fashions. Right? In the mass training condition, they would see in a consecutive sequence paintings by the same artist. So for example, these are all painted by the same artist. They might see this painting, and, and of course, it, you know, it's accompanied by the label of the, art, the, the artist's name. So they would know, you know artist A painted this, and they would see another painting by artist A, another painting by artist A, another painting by artist A, and so on. So in a consecutive sequence, they would see paintings by the same artist all grouped together. So this is the, what they call the mass condition. This other condition they would see a painting by artist A, and then a painting by artist B, and then a painting by artist C, D, E, and so on. So in this condition, they would never see in a consecutive sequence two paintings by the same artist. Everything was interleaved. They would never get to see the same artist's paintings back to back. And of course, again, every, every time the artist's name accompanied the painting, so they, they, their job was to learn, okay, what's the style of each painter? So that later on, on a test, they were presented with novel paintings by those same artists, so novel in the sense that they had never seen those paintings before, and they were asked to try to categorize. Who do you think painted this one? Who do you think painted that one? So that was the test. Right? So let's take a look at performance on this final test. What we see is paintings, artists that were trained in a, you know, in a spaced manner, subjects learned the styles better. Right? They were better able to categorize and identify the, uh, the novel paintings uh, on the final test. 
than if they were exposed to that artist's paintings in a massed fashion, right? everything grouped together, one after another, the same uh, uh, painter. So that's the actual test performance. What's interesting is they also ask their subjects, after they did this final test, they ask their subjects, which training regimen do you think was more effective for you? Right? So all subjects experience both. Right? Half of the paint, paint, painters were, were presented in the mass condition. The other half were painted, uh, presented in the, in the uh, spaced condition. And so they got to experience both. Right? So not, and they, they took the final test. This is how they performed. Then they asked them, which, which training regimen do you think was more effective? The majority of subjects felt that having been trained in a mass fashion was superior. They felt, we, I learned the subjects, the, the, the painter's style, painting style better when I was presented in a mass fashion, when I got to see them all together. So this is an indication where, an indication of how you know, learners' intuitions might not always match up with actual learning. So I'm going to talk about one of my studies now. This is a study that follow up, followed up on the Cornell and, Bjork, uh, the, the, yeah, Cornell and Bjork study. And I was interested in asking the question of the spacing advantage that they found. Is it due to temporal spacing, spacing out in time, or is it due to interleaving? Right? And so I'll explain, I'll you know, elaborate on that. Right? So we had four conditions in this experiment. In the mass condition, this is the same as the Cornell and Bjork study. Right? They would see all the paintings by the, by this, by the same artist in a consecutive sequence, all artists A, 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 and so on, before moving on to B, 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 B. In the interleaved condition, what I call the interleaved condition, this is what Cornell and Bjork called the space condition. The, the paintings by the different artists were interleaved. So they would see artist A, B, C, A, B, C, and so on. Right? They would never see the same artist's paintings in a, in back to back. Then I had the temporal space condition, where they would see the artists, uh, paintings by the same artist, all massed together, but we built in temporal spacing, a gap in time. Right? So maybe that temporal spacing might improve learning. So we looked at that. And then we also added a condition which, which we call the simultaneous mass condition. Maybe you learn an artist's style best when you get to see many of their paintings or several of their paintings simultaneously at the same time. Right? So we had four paintings at a time by the same artist presented on the screen. So let's take a look at their performance. Again, performance on the final test where we presented them with novel paintings and asked them to categorize them by the artist. Oh, let's show you some examples of the paintings. These, are again, by, were by obscure painters. They were all landscape paintings, right? So pretty hard to tell apart. You know, all of them uh, contained pictures, depicted things like trees, rivers, mountains, things like that, right? It's all fairly similar. So let's take a look at final performance, the ability to categorize novel paintings now. We replicate the Cornell and Bjork effect, right? The idea when you interleave the artist's paintings, people learn the styles better and are able to categorize the novel paintings compared to if you mass them all together, you block them and group them all together. What about temporal spacing? Just spacing them out in time, does it make a difference? Right? What we find is that just inserting time, you know, gaps in time did not benefit their learning of the categories. And also presenting multiple paintings by the same artist at the same time, simultaneous mass, did not improve inductive ability either. So this benefit of spacing that Cornell and Bjork reported does not seem to be due to temporal spacing per se, but rather the interleaving of exemplars, right? And so the question is, why does interleaving facilitate inductive learning? Perhaps it's because when you interleave the different exemplars from different categories, you highlight the differences. You make salient the differences among the categories. And if so, if that's the explanation, then other manipulations that promote this highlighting of the differences should also yield an advantage. So we decided to do a follow-up experiment. We had the same first two conditions, mass versus interleaved, but now we added a third condition, which we call the simultaneous different condition. That means at a single time on the screen, subjects would see three paintings, each by a different painter. And of course, the labels, the artist's name, would, would accompany the, the paintings. Let's take a look at their performance on the final test, their ability to categorize novel paintings. Again, we replicate the interleaving advantage, right, better than mass. And what we find is that the simultaneous different condition also exhibited you know, this advantage of learning, inductive learning. So these results suggest to us that manipulations that facilitate discriminative, discriminative contrast among the categories would enhance induction. And of course, the caveat is that this would apply to categories that are very confusable, categories where there are very low across-category differences. Right? So as you saw from the sample paintings earlier on, this would qualify. Right? It's hard to tell apart these categories. 
And I should also point out that other research groups have found converging results uh, from looking at people's ability to categorize bird and butterfly species and so on. Right? It's interesting as well, if you're interested in this, interleaving also benefits motor skill acquisition. Right, so many studies have been done on this. Right? If you're going to be training some sort of motor skill, like in this case, baseball, learning to hit pitches, baseball pitches, mixing them up actually benefits you way more than if you block the practice or group the types of pitches together. Right? So they're interested in three types of pitches, fastballs, curveballs, and change-ups. And these were done with skilled baseball players. These were uh, baseball players on the college team. Right? And they have three conditions of practice. Control did not have the extra batting practice. Blocked is when during the extra batting practice they had 15, you know, um, change-ups, 15 curveballs, whatever, right? So, so, so blocked, the type of uh, pitches were blocked. And random, during practice, the pitches that were thrown at them were random. Right? And what we see here, what's important is here on the trans, what they labeled the transfer test. So this is the final test, right? After six weeks of training, how do they perform on this transfer test? And the transfer test was of two kinds, random and blocked. Random, again, meaning they could not predict you know, what type of pitch would be thrown at them, right? And blocked, that means it was all blocked by a certain kind. Of and what we see is that on both kinds of final tests, it's the random training condition that exhibited the greatest benefit, right? the greatest, highest performance, even better than the blocked condition, even when the final test was blocked, right? suggesting again this advantage of interleaving for motor skill acquisition. But let's get back to sort of more academic types of uh, uh, content areas. Right? I'd like to finish up by talking about math learning here. And, you know, Put a picture up there of Doug Rohr, a colleague of mine at the University of South Florida. He's a cognitive psychologist, and he's been one of the key figures that, ha that has studied interleaving effects in math learning. And the next seven slides or so were actually adapted from a talk, uh, talk a presentation that Doug Rohr gave, and of course I have his permission to use them in this talk. And so if you think about solving, successfully being able to solve a math problem, what's required? Well, a prerequisite is you need, the students need to choose the correct strategy. Right? If you don't choose the correct strategy, even if you know how to you know, the formula or the algorithm, you're going to get arrived at the wrong answer, right? And so why is choosing the strategy hard, the correct strategy hard? Well, students usually have to infer the strategy. It's not told to them in advance. When they're taking an exam, you know, a math exam, no one tells you, oh, this is the formula you need to use, right? You just need to infer what, what type of problem is this and what's the strategy to apply in that situation. To give an example, something you might encounter, let's say, in middle school or high school, right? And so you choose the strategy for solving this math problem. Right, rearrange it so that the x is on one side so you can find out the value of x. The challenge is that there are problems that on the surface look similar but actually require different strategies. So now you can look at these two problems. Right? They superficially look very similar, but you know, to solve them, you need to apply different strategies. It's the same one you saw earlier on, but on the right-hand side, it's a different kind of problem, even though superficially it looked very similar to the earlier problem. Yet, not only that, there are problems that don't look similar, they don't look alike, but actually require the same strategy. Right? So there's a word problem about finding the, you know, the distance that a bird has flown, it requires the, the application of Py Pythagorean theorem. You get a question like that that looks very different from the, the first one on the left. It also requires the application of Pythagorean theorem to solve. Right? And you think, oh, you know, that's just you know, for middle school math, you know, basic stuff. You know, by the time you get up to sort of a higher level, you know, that's not a problem anymore. But that's not quite true. If you look at even like college-level math classes, strategy choice is also still an important factor. Right? Think about sort of college algebra. Right? Similar-looking problems, but requiring different types of strategies. College-level calculus, perhaps. Again, similar, very similar-looking, but nonetheless requiring different strategies. You're taking like a statistics course as well, intro statistics course. Again, very similar word problems. But in one case, you need an independent t-test. In the other case, you do a repeated measures t-test. Right? So again, strategy choice is not something that only affects sort of basic math learning. So I described to you a study that Doug Rohrer did. It's an, it's an in-press study. It's a study conducted with seventh grade, so middle school uh, math classes at a middle school in Tampa, Florida. And again, the, the classes went, went on as, as usual, right? teachers would teach as usual and so on. And what they manipulated again was just the homework assignments, right? in order to cause minimal disruption to the class. Right? All they manipulated was the homework assignments. They had block practice. So this is sort of the regular way math homework is assigned. 
there will be 12 problems in the assignment following the lesson, all on that same topic, right? So you learn about this thing, and then you go home and do 12 problems on that thing. Right? So that's block practice, the typical way it's done. And they also had the condition that they call interleave practice. Again, 12 problems on that homework assignment, but four problems would be on that topic of the day, and the eight problems would be from other topics, right? Previous topics. So it's important to note that every student worked on the same, exact same problems. Only the ordering of those problems uh, varied across the semester. So this is an example of an interleaved practice assignment. The first four questions would pertain to the topic of the day, the current lesson, and the remaining eight would come from previous lessons. Right? Right, so the, the critical difference is that for interleaved practice assignment, problems of different kinds were interleaved within the same assignment. Problems of the same kind were spaced across different assignments. Right? So that was the key feature for interleaved practice assignments. So this was the timeline. This is done in, in a semester at the middle school, right, over nine weeks. And then there was a delay of two weeks, and then the students received a surprise test. So this is part of the middle school math curriculum. This is not like arbitrary materials that were being taught to the kids, right? This is just stuff that they would learn in their normal math classroom anyway. Take a look at the results on the surprise test. Right? Topics that were practiced in an interleaved fashion, 72%. It's a surprise test. Students weren't expecting the test, so they didn't study for it or anything like that, right? The items practiced in the, in the interleaved fashion, 72%. Those in the blocked fashion, 38%. And if you know effect sizes, is Cohen's D of 1.05, which is a very large effect size, very impressive, right? And again, bear in mind, this is a classroom study. You don't have control over, you know, which topics students prefer to study, you know, how much time they spend on their homework. You don't have control about, uh, over that. It's up to the student to do it, right? And nonetheless, they found this huge impact of the interleaved practice. Right? And so not surprising, Benedict Carey of the New York Times actually wrote about this study last fall. It was published in the New York Times, so they received some good press. Right? So I'm going to summarize what I've talked about in this third section of the talk. Right? Spacing seems to benefit category learning when the exemplars, the instances, are interleaved. And the explanation for that is when you juxtapose you know, two members from different categories, that helps the learner sort of notice and appreciate which dimensions or features sort of uh, maximally discriminate um, uh, between those two categories, right? So it improves your ability to categorize. Interleaving during math learning, during math problem solving, right? Also enhan you know, enhances math problem solving, right? So again, the reason for that is if you think about how to solve a math problem correctly, students need to learn to dif differentiate among different kinds of problems. Even if superficially they look like the same kind of problem, they may require a different strategy, a different algorithm, a different formula, right? So knowing how to execute a strategy alone is insufficient. One needs to first identify the features of a problem that tell you, that indicate to you which concept or which procedure is appropriate. And so when you block practice, when you put practice of all the same kinds of topics together, you short-circuit this step. You no longer need, for the student no longer needs to figure out what type of problem is this, because it's all the same kind of problem. So just to illustrate this, look at these typical sort of math worksheet assignments given in middle school. They're all on the Pythagorean theorem. All the practice problems are all the same type. Right? So by the time you get to practice problem number four, you, you know what's going on just to keep plugging away at it and just doing the same thing again and again without really thinking, what is this problem about? Right? So even when you get to the word problem at the end, you often don't even have to read the word problem. You just have to plug in the numbers and solve it. Right? So this is the way, you know, quite often, middle school math you know, type of practice occurs in middle school math. And so in terms of practical implications, you know, like you to think about your own classes, your own assignments, your own sort of uh, homework assignments and so on, is practice usually blocked or interleaved? Then tie it all up with some general conclusions. Um, hopefully, today I've convinced you that taking a test can be a powerful learning event, right? Often yields better retention of the information than just additional studying. I've also talked about how testing that involve more effortful retrieval uh, usually produces more, you know, a greater uh, benefit, right? And of course, this, is, this should be coupled with corrective feedback. And, you know, if you're going to review material that you're trying to learn, you probably want to wait a while, since, you know, um, between each exposure to the material, right? And basically space out your review opportunities because you get more bang for your buck. You get way more out of that review opportunity if you space it out. I've also shown you how testing and spacing can be combined, right, in terms of space retrieval practice. 
and also interleaving of items from different categories can, can be useful for inductive learning, right? Because it facilitates discrimination of, of easily confusable categories, right? And in terms of my lab, in terms of current and future directions, I'm interested in sort of applying testing, spacing, and interleaving these three different sort of phenomena to sort of more higher order types of learning, right? I think more research in this area needs to be done with sort of STEM, science, technology, math type of materials. And so we are planning to run experiments looking at, for example, cladograms. These are uh, diagrams often find in biology uh, that represent the phylogenetic relationships among different species, right? So, it, you know, you know, whether testing and spacing can, can improve learning of cladograms. I'm also interested in whether interleaving can learn, can improve learning of um, organic chemistry compounds, right? And I'm also interested in causal reasoning in science. So this diagram here basically illustrates, uh, basically uh, uh, describes the effects of space travel on the body, on the human body, right? How the loss of gravity eventually leads to increased potential for kidney stones, right? So if people are reading a text that contains all that information, you know, does testing and spacing, you know, enhance their ability to do the causal reasoning, to, to basically draw out this causal chain from all the information contained in the text? And I'm also interested in exploring in the future, right, experiments in more real, in sort of real world learning environments, be they schools or cl college classrooms, also in online tutoring platforms. So I'd like to end off by acknowledging some funding sources and colleagues and collaborators, right? I'd like to acknowledge the Institute of Education Sciences, the McDonald Foundation, National Science Foundation. On the left are professors and colleagues from grad school, Washington University in St. Louis. And on the right hand side is uh, professors and colleagues from UC San Diego, where I did my postdoc. And I would like to uh, acknowledge my members in my current lab now. So this is Luke Eglinton, a grad student in Dartmouth Psychological and Brain Sciences doctoral program. And on the right, uh, uh, undergraduates who help out in the lab. And I'd be happy to take any questions, comments. Thanks. Personal preferences for semesters, because there's more time, right? Um, so the important thing about spacing is that many people, when sort of the take-home date, the take-home message people sort of uh, take with them about spacing is sometimes, in a, I guess, a bit inappropriate. People think that, oh, spacing means that if you're going to study for an exam or study for the material for an exam, you don't want to... You, you, you want to do a bit of studying chapters one and two on this day, and then chapters three and four on the following day, and so on, right? But here, when talking about spacing, it's about repetition of the same material, reviewing of the same material. So let's say chapter one. If you're going to repeat your exposure to chapter one, when should you do it, right? And so I think even in the case of a, 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 a short quarter term that we have, let's say, here at Dartmouth, you know, as long as educators and students are mindful that you know, it's worth reviewing information, not just getting to see it once, if you're going to review the information, to really uh, think of how they can build in spacing. And I think you can, even in a sort of a compressed 10-week term, you can do that. But certainly with the semester, you probably have more flexibility. Um, which, which study were you talking about? Uh, the, first topic. the first topic on testing. Yes. yes. Was it my the, um, study uh, uh, reading the uh, journal articles? Oh yeah, so yeah, of course. I mean, all all, the, all these are published findings. So they they have, uh, you know, there was appropriate statistical tests, inferential statistical tests that were done to show that the differences in the sample were statistically significant. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you had a bar chart on the spacing effect, mm -hmm. but it seems to me, if I read it right, that only about sixteen percent of the uh, of the, the subject matter was retrieved. So that the it, it might have been improved by the spacing effect, but it doesn't seem to make a really big difference. 
So, so bear in mind, this is um, um, four weeks after prior exposure. So the final test was administered four weeks after their last reading of a passage. So there was a very long gap, if you would. Right? So, so that's why performance was so low. You're right. I mean, if you, you paid attention to this uh, y-axis, you know that, that, that performance is really low. People don't remember much four weeks after reading a passage, passage twice. But certainly it indicates that having that one-week gap between the successive rereading actually benefits you, yeah, even four weeks out. Oh, yes, Alex? Sure. Is this the one? So you're right. So in this case here, what we found, I mean, from the inferential statistical test is that it is the initial short answer condition that produced significant benefits above and beyond the read answers condition. Right, so the red bars are significantly taller than the green bars. The blue bars are not significantly taller than the green bars. So likewise, here on the short answer format as well, the red bars are significantly taller than the green bars, but not the blue bars. The blue bars are not taller than the green bars. Uh, I, don't quite, I, I don't know the exact details because I didn't conduct, conduct that study, but it was uh, basically um, uh, different topics within a, a, a intro statistics sort of class. So my guess would be that there would be some level of building on So what you're, you're suggesting is if they were just to retrieve anything else, retrieving their shopping list, yeah. that would help? Yeah. Uh, no. So, so uh, the, the benefits of testing can be quite specific. So um, it's, you do some, 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 sometimes find advantages that, that, that uh, spread to related information. But let's say if you learn about Neptune, the, the, the planet Neptune, right, and, and, and you learn about the planet I know, some other planet, Venus. If you practice a lot of your retrieval on Neptune, that often does not have any impact of your learning on, on v, of Venus. Unless the fact that you're retrieving, some fact that you're retrieving about Neptune is directly related to Venus. Right? If there is a very close relationship in the facts, then you're retrieving one can actually benefit the other as well. But for totally independent stuff, no, you're not going to find any benefits. Yeah. Yes, Alex? Uh, well, I think you can always have new material, but I mean, if you have testing be, uh, be something that is regularly occurring in the class. Um, so, for example, in some of my classes, I try to have daily quizzes, just short little quizzes, you know, like 10 minutes at the beginning of each class that, that test stuff from before. Um, students are always getting tested on every part of the course. There's no, no part of the course that they're not being quizzed on. Mm -hmm. uh, does that have more value in terms of the repeated retrieval than just simply asking them about material that was covered uh, the previous time uh, or something of that nature that is not graded, that is not formal, mm -hmm. that still evokes the, uh, the, the past information? Mm -hmm. um, my sense is that retrieval need not, the, the benefits of retrieval need not be restricted to formal tests or quizzes. It doesn't have to be like an, an actual test that the teacher has set and you sit down and you answer the questions. I think retrieval can be done informally as well. So, you know, advice that you can give your students if they're having trouble, you know, revising their, their work or at least not, you know, having trouble doing well on the exams is 
when they're studying, to encourage them to do retrieval on their own, right? So they have their lecture slides or their notes in front of them. After studying it, if they think they're confident, why not just cover up half of it? Look at the heading, look, and then look away and, and try to sort of bring to mind what is, what is all that stuff about? And then, of course, consult the notes, give feedback, right? So once you've practiced retrieving and you think you know all the, you've retrieved everything, look back at your notes again. Did you miss anything, right? And I think that's a good way to sort of just informally practice retrieval on one's own. Mm -hmm. um, to my knowledge, there haven't been many studies done at sort of the very at the younger childhood level, uh, but certainly spacing studies have been done. If you're looking at just learning of, let's say, spelling, learning of sort of basic memory, information memor memorizing of basic stuff, you would find those effects very robust even at the younger ages. But not too many studies have been done. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.